We have got a celebrity in our presence, San Francisco Don head coach, Todd Golden. He is the 20th head coach in program history, and he got the job at the Dons. What were you, Todd? 33 at the time? Yeah, I guess so. I just turned, or, <clears throat> excuse me, I was, you know, two months away from being 34, but yeah, I was 33. And you're heading into your second season. What a first year, 22 and 12. I'm Brian Fenley with Fox Sports Radio. I'm on Twitter at Brian Fenley. And, and Todd, how many times have you been mistaken for a player? <laughs> it's happened a few times for sure. You know, the general time where it happens the most is coming in and out of airports. Okay. <laughs> uh, you know, getting on the plane and, and, you know, whether it's in the baggage area or whatever. And, you know, we have some big boys. And especially if I'm freshly shaven, it, it yeah. usually helps. Um, but yeah, it, it it's happened one or two times, that's for sure. What are the chances, if you had all your current players on the court, you were on the court as well, there was a three-point contest that you would win? I'd have a shot. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't know if I'd be able to get it done. We have some, some really, really high-level shooters, uh, you know, at the top of our program between guys like Dismitri Rivney and, and Julian Richwain, the young man that's transferred from Boston College. Uh, you know, those two guys specifically can really, really poke it. Um, but I, I'd have a chance. You know, I'd probably fatigue pretty quickly if it was an extended <laughs> period of time. I might run into some trouble. But uh, I, I like to mess around with our guys every now and again and shoot with them. So it's, a, it's still an enjoyable thing for me. I think you're just being humble right now. And deep down, you're like, yeah, I got them every single time. <laughs> Todd Golden is with us, head coach for the Dons. I'm Brian Fenley. And, and Todd, you give off this vibe like – even though you're still new in the head coaching game, that you've been here before. And I think that's what's really commendable about you is that you have this coaching gene that is so inherent in your chemical makeup. What's an instance removed from basketball where you find yourself slipping into that coach mode? And this could be a good thing or a bad thing. Maybe it's being a parent or, or something like that. Oh, you know what? It's funny because it kind of happened this weekend. Um, you know, I won't go into too, too many specifics, but I got a, a good buddy who uh, plays on the PGA Tour and uh, hasn't, hasn't been playing to the best of his abilities and is kind of in a rut. And uh, I actually was with him and, and his caddy up in Tahoe uh, over the weekend. And so we were, you know, just catching up. And, and yeah. him and I were just discussing everything going on. And, and I just started kind of giving <laughs> my two cents on – you know, his approach and, you know, what I thought he could do a little differently to maybe give himself a better chance to be successful and uh, kind of caught myself pretty quick and was like, Hey, <laughs> I apologize. You know, I just want to make sure you want this feedback and, yeah. uh, and he was great about it, but you know, it's just kind of, I think there's a little truth to what you're saying. It's kind of who I am a little bit. And I try to take more of a, uh, you know, take a step back and evaluate a lot of different things. I'm a pretty analytical person as it is. So that that's probably part of it, but uh, yeah, it shows up a lot. Uh, you know, my wife probably thinks it shows up too much. Uh, <laughs> so I, I try not to let it happen too often at home, but yeah, man, I, I, I love being a coach. You've got two young kids, right? I do. When's a time you remember your oldest child lecturing you about basketball? You know what? He's a, uh, it, he comes by practice quite a bit, you know, okay. so he's, you know, he just turned four a little bit ago. So he, you know, he's not super comfortable around the Dons yet. Cause he walks in and these guys are, are humongous. Yeah. They, they look like giants to him. You know, the, the area where he really does try to coach me up is on, on the golf course and in the driving mm -hmm. range. He's got a little game um, and he really enjoys it. And, you know, we'll be out there messing around and there'll be some times where it's like, daddy, you got to hit it straighter than that. You know, <laughs> Um, luckily he hasn't, my, my dad's the one that tries to give me the hoops advice. Okay. So kind of, uh, filter that, but Jakey is more of a, definitely more of a golfer at this point in his career. Okay. Just wait, just wait a couple years from now. He'll, he'll be showering you with advice on basketball. Not sure. Not sure. I'm <laughs> <waiting> for it. <laughs> what about the character traits of like, like when you, when you look at like, okay, I'm going to marry this person and they better understand what it's like to be the spouse of a division one head basketball coach. Like what are the musts on the resume? You know what? I, I think I hit the lottery, uh, you know, with, with my wife, uh, Megan, she's, she's phenomenal. You know, I think a couple things about her that makes our relationship work so well and, and gives me the confidence to really be aggressive in terms of being a good coach is, 
uh, you know, she was a college athlete. She played volleyball. Uh, so she understands kind of the division one grind, so to speak. And then she, she grew up in an army family. Her father was in the military. So they moved around quite a bit, uh, you know, her childhood. And so she understands that piece of college athletics as well. You know, we've moved from the Bay to New York, New York down to Alabama, Alabama back to the Bay. So, you know, in the 10 years or so that we've been together, we've moved around quite a bit. And again, like her, her uh, understanding of that gives me a lot of confidence to work really hard and, uh, and hopefully continue to be successful in this area. Kyle Smith has always had a whole lot of confidence in you, your, your coach who I believe recruited you, right, at St. Mary's. And then you have worked under him for several years before taking over for him at the University of San Francisco. What did Kyle see in you early on that prompted to hold you in such a high esteem where he really committed to nurturing you up the coaching ranks? Yeah, you know, it's, uh, I, he is uh, the main individual in terms of my career that I'm, you know, very appreciative uh, to the time I've spent with him. And, and to your point, you know, the fact that as an associate head coach back in his day at St. Mary's recruited me as a walk-on at first and, and gave me an opportunity to really become a Division One basketball player. And honestly, I, I assume he saw some of himself, you know, <laughs> as a young yeah. man. Sure. Uh, you know, Kyle was a grinder. Uh, he, you know, he was a great point guard at Hamilton University back east. I think they were the number one team in the country in D3, uh, either his junior or senior year. And, uh, you know, just as a young kid playing on the AAU circuit for one summer, you know, I played on a good Arizona Stars team out of Phoenix. And uh, I, I think he saw a guy that, you know, did a lot of the little things and, and someone that maybe didn't have the most talent, but worked really hard and, and was a leader on the floor and, and gave other guys on his team confidence. And uh, he, he did. He gave me a great opportunity to come into the program with Coach Bennett at St. Mary's. And, and I think I did a good job taking advantage of that. But uh, if it weren't for him, I, I definitely wouldn't be here today. Sure. As, as someone who I've observed coaching and, and watching your mannerisms and your demeanor during games and, and seeing how you conduct yourself, you seem to have that I'm always in control of the moment. I'm, I'm very cool under pressure. You know that. But when was the most emotional you've ever been on the court coaching? I would definitely, it is, this isn't very hard, you know, as a head coach, at least it was definitely this year at St. Mary's. Um, you know, we got off to a great start and, and uh, you know, then they came back a little bit. I don't think we got the best whistle um, in the history of college basketball, which affected us a little bit that game. Sure. And I was definitely uh, really wound up because um, it, it was an emotional game for me, you know, going back to where, you know, I kind of uh, sewed my oats as a player. Mm -hmm as a student athlete and uh you know to go back in there as a head coach about 12 years later was was pretty incredible to be honest and uh it was you know it was hard to not to kind of calm myself down before that game we got off to a great start which kind of probably raised the stakes a little more um but i i, I did my best to get a technical especially in the second <laughs> half of that game I, I they they didn't give me one i think they understood that the 19 to 2 free throw count was enough and they didn't want to go <laughs> oh, <laughs> uh or whatever it was at the point but uh that that was an emotional one for sure um and I, i'd say probably the where i felt you know uh more volatile than any other situation throughout the season when you were a player at saint mary's and you had the pleasure of teaming up with patty mills and you, you see what he's done ever since his college days why do you think he's been able to have such a staying power in the nba Patty is one of the most unique individuals uh, that I've been able to spend some time with. And it was really a great a situation for both of us that year. I was a fifth year senior. Uh, you know, I'd been around the program a long time. You know, I really had a great understanding of, of the, the school, uh, just socially what was going on. And then obviously the program, you know, I, I felt like I was on the same page as all the coaches, you know, I'd been there longer than most of them had. So uh, to be able to nurture him as a young freshman, and to see him come in, you know, his – obviously, you know, the skills and his talents speak for, for themselves, but really what I believe separates Patty from a lot of these other young players uh, and now guys in the NBA is his, his level of belief was, uh, was so high. You know, when he got to St. Mary's, I remember we, had, we were doing some exercise with other student-athletes um, with a speaker coming in, and, and we were talking about goals, and, and we were paired up. And one of the things – the first thing he said to me was, you know, I, I want to play in the NBA. I want to play in the NBA. Wow. And, and I was like, that's a pretty good goal. Let's, let's see how that <laughs> thing goes, right? 
Yeah. But, you know, he, he, he always feels like he belongs. Uh, you know, I think as a 20-year-old or 21-year-old, he scored 20 points in the Olympics against Team USA when they were completely stacked. And, uh, you know, it's just something that, that he had, he's always had that chip on his shoulder to be able to, you know, prove that he belongs. But, again, he's always known deep down um, that he's capable. And I think that along with his work ethic, uh, you know, and, and just his understanding of the game has really uh, given him that staying power at the, at the highest level. How, when he got to St. Mary's, were you able to help acclimate him to life in the United States, coming over from Australia, and make him feel comfortable? Well, honestly, it was, uh, it was one of those things where I, as soon as I saw him play, I knew that I, ha- I better have a pretty good relationship with him. <laughs> it's going to be hard for me to stay on the floor. Uh, you know, my sophomore and junior year, I had played a decent amount of point guard there, and, and him coming in, you know, he was going to play point guard. So I, I had to kind of figure out the best way to slide over to the two and, and be uh, a good catch and shoot guy for him and, and, and help him in a basketball standpoint. But again, you know, the thing that made it really easy was he was a great young man. You know, he was, he was really enjoyable to be around. So socially it was really took a liking to me because, you know, a lot of sometimes older guys uh, are a little harder on the young guys or, you know, they, they want to kind of, control their territory whereas I understood there was room for both of us and that it could work out uh, as long as as we had good chemistry both on and off the floor so you know those things were really important to both of us and uh, again you know he felt really comfortable with me early on I felt really comfortable with him um, in every aspect and and, you know again we started I think 32 or 33 games together that year and, and we had a really good season we ended up playing in the NCAA tournament. Why is Randy Bennett so good at his job? Where, where, where do I start? <laughs> oh, man, he uh, – sim- similar to with, with what we talked about with Patty's qualities, you know, he – Coach Bennett, you know, he, he knows what he's doing. You know, I think – and he has great confidence uh, in the way he runs his program. Uh, just like any coach, you know, I think he got off to a pretty good start at St. Mary's. And then my sophomore and junior year, we were kind of floating. Uh, you know, we had two around 500 seasons where – uh, the novelty of that first tournament run had worn off and, and we needed to kind of revitalize, but he got it back on track. And really from that second tournament run through even last year where they were, where they would have been a tournament team. Yeah. I mean, they, they've kept it going at such an elite level. And, and the insane thing about it is the success that Gonzaga and coach few has had is kind of taken some of the spotlight off of, of what Randy has done. But if what St. Mary's uh, and Randy, have accomplished if that had been done in like the A10 or, or the mm-hmm. Missouri Valley or something like that. I mean, he'd be talked about as one of the top, you know, five to 10 coaches in the country. Uh, he, he really understands how to coach. I think he has a great, you know, understanding of defense uh, and, and just program and, and really good understanding of the sweet spot of his recruiting. Uh, obviously the Australian pipeline has, has been incredible for them and they've been mm-hmm. able to continue to ride that out almost close to 20 years now. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they've started to get some really good, you know, domestic players as well. And uh, again, like he, you know, people, some people are thinking, oh, they might not be as good next year. You know, they lost fits, they lost four. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't doubt for a second that, you know, they're going to challenge to win the league uh, just because that's what he does. And, and, and he doesn't really know anything else. Yeah, for him, it always seems to be reloading, not rebuilding. And you have done such a great job looking at what you've done so far with USF and you play Gonzaga so close. What is it about the way you match up and playing up to that team where you guys are invested in some nail biters? Yeah. You know, I think first of all, you know, our, my, one of my associate head coaches, Kevin Hubby, he, he has a scout and he's done a phenomenal job of really just drilling down and getting a great understanding of how they operate, especially on the offensive end. You know, I think they're generally, you know, year to year top, five, 10 offensive team in the country analytically. And, uh, you know, I think especially last year, we, we did come up with some good things on the defensive end that bothered what they were doing and kind of took them out of their comfort zone. And uh, what I think we do a really good job of is understanding what we can live with and what we're not comfortable living with. And then on top of that, with everything that Kevin's done to get an understanding of that, our players have done a really good job of executing the game plan. In all three of our matchups last year, uh, I, I've, I walked away from those games feeling like our guys, you know, executed almost to a T, you know, about mm-hmm. 95, 98% in terms of what we wanted. Um, and on top of that, you know, we, we have some guys that, that bother them on the offensive end. You know, we have some really good quickness. Uh, you know, Jimbo Lowell was a really big factor for us last year inside, and I think bothered them uh, around the paint. 
Um, but, you know, we, we're just making that jump. You know, I think our program and that confidence level uh, resonates throughout the staff and the players. And, you know, going into that uh, conference semis game, I, I thought we had a very good chance to win. You know, I, I really did. I felt like we were walking into that game with confidence. We had just played great against the little Marymount and Pacific in the first couple games of the conference tournament. Gonzaga hadn't played yet. So we, you know, we were comfortable in Vegas. And uh, again, you know, in both in the first and the third game, if we just shoot the ball a little bit better, we win those games. And, and to me, to have that, to have that base knowing, all right, if we can poke it a little bit, then we're going to win. Then that's great. Especially against the top five team in the country. You gotta, you gotta get lucky a little bit. Uh, and again, like going into next year, uh, I think our program's at the point now where we have the confidence, especially on our home floor, where we feel like we can and should beat those guys. The great Todd Golden is with us, head coach for San Francisco. I'm Brian Fenley with Fox Sports Radio. I'm on Twitter at Brian Fenley. And looking towards next year, you have, and I've listened to some of your recent interviews, you are really pleased with the backcourt play that you have. Take us through some of the key pieces that you are excited about and look forward to making humongous contributions towards. You know, I think um, the two guys that were just absolutely phenomenal last year uh, over the course of the year was, you know, Jamari Bouguet, who's going to be a senior for us, and Khalil Shabazz, who will be a redshirt junior. Those guys really, uh, obviously, were really good individually, um, but together, I, I think they were one of the best backcourts around. You know, they really did a good job disrupting um, the defensive end, and then their quickness and athleticism really bothered people in transition. We were able to get out and get some easy baskets that way. Uh, so, And I expect both those guys to take another jump. You know, last year was the first year that Jamari kind of had to run the team. You know, he had Frankie Ferrari next to him this first couple of years. Uh, and I thought Jamari did an admirable, admirable job in kind of picking up that load. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, especially towards the end of the year, you know, he had done a great job early, kind of peaked in the middle of the year and then took out another jolt down the stretch. And that was really awesome to see. Uh, and I think he'll, he'll do a really nice job for us. And Khalil is, uh, I'm really excited about him this season. You know, I probably didn't play him enough last year, to be honest. Um, and that won't be an issue this year. He's going to get out there and get a, get a lot of reps and get a lot of opportunities to score. And he's just a light bulb, man. Great energy, uh, really good leader. He really tries to lift up his teammates. And uh, he's just a guy you like to have on your team. And two other guys in the backcourt who, who I think will be really, really tough is Damari Milstead, uh, the young man who transferred from Grand Canyon. He sat out for us last year. It'll be another redshirt junior. Again, you know, we have some veterans in the backcourt. Damari is just uh, – he's a leader as well. He's a, he's a point guard. Really, really tough in the pick and roll. Uh, he's, you know, picked it up shooting-wise. He's gotten really comfortable from, from the perimeter. But where he can really, really help us is just quarterback in that defense. He really can pick up the ball, guard at 94 feet. And uh, he, he's just strong. He's a grown man. He's a, he's a grown man in college, and I think he's going to really help us. And, and we're still waiting to hear on uh, Julian Richwain's waiver, the transfer from Boston College. Sure. Uh, and if, if he is able to get eligible – uh, he, he's one of the best shooters I've ever been around. And I think he wow. can really, really space the floor for us and, and give those guys a lot of room to operate. How much credit are you taking for Auburn's final four run? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, not, not, not very much. But I, I was really appreciative and thankful to have recruited some of the guys that, that were, you know, instrumental players on that team. You know, the one guy, Anthony McLemore, uh, you know, was a young man that, you know, start to finish that I led on his recruitment. And uh, he was a guy that just didn't have a lot of, a lot of recruitment, which was pretty insane to me because he was a 4-0 student, uh, you know, was kind of in the backwoods of Georgia and uh, in a little bit of an underappreciated area. Uh, but he was just an incredible kid and was always really uh, productive on the AU circuits. Playing, he played for the Atlanta Celtics, the Adidas circuit. And uh, it was a guy that I just kind of asked – I not begged, but really pushed for Bruce to take a chance on him. And uh, he did. And knock on wood, the guy ended up starting on a Final Four team. So it, it worked out really, really well. And, you know, guys like Jared Harper, who I didn't lead on, but uh, was involved with and, and, you know, built a really good relationship with him and his father, Pat. Uh, just another great kid who I, I think is going to end up being a really, really good NBA player. I, you know, I think in the next three to five years, you're going to see him as a guy that uh, just takes a leap, especially with some of these smaller guards being able to, to stick. Uh, he's a super talented kid. Um, but, you know, it was, it was really awesome to see that happen because the first two years were hard, you know. My two years there, we weren't very good. Uh, we were changing the culture of the program. Uh, a lot of long days, you know, just kind of getting everything going in the right direction. And uh, 
you know, I, I knew when I left to come back here to San Francisco that I might miss the boat on a really fun run uh, that, that they were putting together. But, you know, just to get back out west to work with Kyle again and, and knock on wood the way it's all worked out for me to be able to be the head coach here in San Francisco, uh, you know, I, I don't regret leaving, but I do, I do miss those guys and uh, was really happy for them that they were able to accomplish that. So in other words, you're taking a lot of credit. I'm just kidding. I'll take about two percent. I'll take two percent. Two percent. Yeah. How about how much of a percentage would you say you give importance to analytics and how you use that to base your coaching decisions? It's uh, you know, I, I'd say it's it's not as simple as that because I think for me, I, I'm just more of an analytical person, you know. And so a lot of the things that I do, uh, you know, I take more of an analytical approach and I try to be really efficient. Uh, and so. It's kind of who I am. I, I think we have a decent amount of guys on our staff that are like that way as well. And we do have a decent mix. So, and I think that's important too, because I, I think you can become too analytical. And, and when you do that, um, it gets a little, gets a little dicey, but we, we try to really what we try to do is just evaluate every situation we have and, and make a good conscious decision based off the facts that we have. That, I mean, that's really the nuts and bolts of what we do. And, and analytically it shows up in different things from scheduling to evaluating our own players recruiting um so obviously we do have a lot of that but it's really just our overall approach and the way we look at things from start to finish why do you think players respond so well to you oh um you know i, I think i try to you know i i don't want to say give confidence i don't i don't think you can really give somebody confidence sure. but you can put them in position and be successful and uh try to keep it you know where as long as they're going really hard and trying to execute what we're asking them to do the results are what they are. Um, definitely more process oriented that way. And I think that takes some heat off some guys. So they know, all right, if I'm not shooting the ball well, but I'm doing it within the framework of our offense, like, you know, coach is going to let me keep shooting. And that, that's just the reality. Um, being younger, uh, it definitely helps. I think I have a better, you know, a good understanding of what these guys are going through. It wasn't that long ago that I was in college. And so, yeah. you know, when you're dealing with some social things. Uh, I can kind of think back and, you know, yeah, that happened. And, you know, how did I deal with it or how did we deal with it as, you know, as, as a student athlete? Um, and I, I just, I think, again, like I, if guys are enjoying um, being a part of the program, playing for our coaching staff, I think that gives them the best chance to be successful and to be good on the floor. So just trying to keep it, uh, you know, structured, try to keep it organized, um, but not like super, super strict, if that makes sense. And, it, and it's a healthy, it's a healthy balance. It's not always easy, but, um, you know, just understanding and trying to let guys be themselves as well. My final question for you, and, and Todd, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on and, and talk hoops and the growing program of San Francisco, which I have the ultimate confidence in the world. You are going to thrive as you already have in a huge way. What's something that Bruce Pearl said to you that resonates for you for a lifetime? Wow. There, there's, a, there's a few, I'm sure. Um, you know, where Bruce, I don't know if there is one specific thing, but what Bruce did from the moment that I got down to Auburn, now, and keep in mind, I played for him back in 2009 or 10, one of those summers on the USA Maccabia team, Okay. Uh, which is uh, like a Jewish Olympics type deal. Sure. So that's where we first started our relationship. But Bruce always gave me confidence to, to kind of spearhead what I thought was important, what I thought would help us at Auburn. And I was, you know, I was coming down to him as more of an analytical uh, thinker from Columbia with Kyle. And that was something that he wasn't really, uh, I don't want to say comfortable with, but just he didn't really know yet. It wasn't something that he had spent a lot of time focusing on. So he, he did give me a ton of responsibility, even in that first year as the director of basketball operations. And, and that was like, all right, if, if a guy like Bruce, who's won so many games, had been to an Elite Eight at Tennessee, had you know, lifted the UWM uh, program to a, a tournament when he was at Milwaukee, Mm -hmm. The guy is one of the best coaches around. If he's confident in me to be able to do those things, then, then why shouldn't I be confident in myself to go out and execute them? And, and that was, you know, just always, you know, giving me that push to, to be aggressive and doing what I wanted to do. Um, you know, he leaned on me for things, which was awesome. You know, it was like, all right, yeah, you know, and gave me that equity in the program, which really, again, you know, gave me that confidence to, to, to help him. Um, but he, he was a, a great – uh, great dude with our family, you know, was really, really accepting of Megan and, and making us, you know, feel good about being at Auburn. And uh, trust me, it was really tough to leave him. And it's a guy that uh, I speak to all the time and, and we stay in really close touch. And uh, uh, 
uh, I really appreciate having him along with Kyle as mentors, you know, as I continue this coaching thing. You surround yourself with Titans in college basketball, and that equates to you being a Titan in college basketball <laughs> as you are on the rise. I, I forgot I wanted to ask you this. Yeah. What's your golf handicap? I'm around 11 right now. Solid. I'm, I'm solid. Uh, you know, I, I'd like to be a little better, um, but especially during the quarantine, I've had a little bit of an opportunity to play. Yeah. Um, my dad's a pretty good golfer. He's around a seven or an eight. And so uh, I, I hope to, to drop that thing below 10 at some point. But I, I have a feeling, knock on wood, if things, you know, continue to trend in this direction of having yeah. a normal season, which it looks like we're going to do, uh, I, I don't think I'm going to be playing too much until next April or May. So it, it might drop back down a little bit. But, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a fun game, man. And I think for guys like myself that, you know, deem themselves as shooters and, and having good hand-eye, it's a, it's, a, it's a challenging, you know, enjoyable thing to do. I think giving golf a break is an okay thing because you know you are committed to basketball and more in that realm. And then when you do go out there and you don't play well, you have that excuse. Yeah, you know, I haven't played that much. Been, much. <laughs> <laughs> Todd Golden, it's been a pleasure. And I am so excited for you moving forward in the direction of this team. And I hope our paths cross in person soon when we do get back to normalcy and we do, as we continue to see progress with everything going on moving forward. Awesome. Brian, I appreciate it, brother. And uh, absolutely stay in touch. And uh, thanks for your interest in the Dons.